what I want to do is because I know on the first homework assignment um, they had you calculate someone's income tax, and I realized after I taught this the first semester that the book never actually told you guys how to go about doing that. It just assumes that it's common sense and everyone can do it. Um, and the fact is, is that most of you probably have never done your taxes. Maybe your parents are doing them, or maybe you don't have to file them. Whatever the case is, and it's really not as intuitive as it seems. Um, so I just wanted to go through a couple of examples using the tax schedule to have you guys calculate how to come up with the income tax number using the schedule. Um, so that way, when you get to the homework, you can do it. Okay. So guys, when we get to chapter four, what we're going to find out is that we always go, I'm going to pass you out 1040s and they're in your books. We're, for the most part, going to follow what's uh, called a Form 1040, which is an individual's income tax return, okay? And the top part of that form starts out with, you know, basic information, uh, you know, any children you may have, things like that, and then we pick our filing status and we select our exemptions, okay? Uh, and then it goes on, the first section is all about gross income. What is your gross income? And we'll figure out what is and what isn't gross income. Then you subtract your exemptions if you have any, and you subtract out any deductions, which we'll get through in chapter six. And you arrive at what is taxable income. This is the individual taxpayer's tax base. This is the point at which you're gonna turn to the tax schedule and figure out, okay, well, how much tax do I have? Um, there's four different schedules, and it's based on filing status. You'll see there's actually five different filing statuses, but two of them share a schedule, okay? So when we get to chapter four, we're gonna talk about how to pick our filing status. And then from there, you guys will say, okay, I have to use this table. Um, so, but now when you get to the table, what I'm gonna tell you about it, and we're gonna talk about this as we get into chapter one more, is this is considered a progressive, uh, a progressive schedule, okay? Federal income tax is a progressive tax. And what that means is that as you earn more taxable income, you get taxed at higher and higher rates. And if you look at these schedules, you'll see that the lowest tier of income gets taxed at 10% per taxable income, okay? So for each taxable uh, dollar of taxable income that you have, they're gonna take 10 cents from you, okay? As you start earning more taxable income, they're gonna start taking 15 cents from you, and so on and so on and so on, okay? Um, so if you are single,
is from your 10% and your 15% tiers. Okay? So you add that up. Okay, so that's 10 plus 15 plus 15,043.75, anyone who's actually worked it through. Okay? Do you follow? All right, you guys try. So let's say we have a married filing joint couple, and they have $150,000 of taxable income. What would their tax be? The tax rates change almost every single year. Um, they usually enact tax rate changes. Uh, you know, it's funny, the scales change, but the dollars actually go down. What you owe actually has gone down a little bit. Um, so it looks like it's gone up, but in fact it hasn't. Um, if you calculate out this year versus last year, what you owe will actually drop. Um, but they'll change most years. And if you look in the back flap of your book, for those of you who have it, and this is why I tell you not to go with an older version of the book, is that even like your personal exemptions, the dollar amounts, last year it was $39.50, this year it's $4,000. Um, the standard deductions, they've all changed. Um, that's why it's very difficult to use an older version of the book because almost, almost every year you can bet that these numbers are gonna change. Maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, but. It's on the very, if you have the textbook, it's on the very last flat, uh, the back flat. And you guys will become familiar with this. Again, I apologize. I wanted, I had, had it here to hand out to you guys today, but um, computing services was giving me a hard time. So, um, but it is here on the back flap of your book for anyone who's using it. And I think as you do the homework, there's a drop down, and it'll be right there for you. Okay. Um, just for those of you who are using the book and you're going to keep it and not return it or maybe not renting it, I would. We're only going to ever use 2015 rates. So maybe just scratch off the 2014, that way you don't mistakenly pick up those numbers ever, um, because 2015 is what we're working with at this point, okay? Okay. Um, so chapter one starts off, and again, this is more background sort of chapter. Uh, it starts by asking, like, who cares about taxes? Why, you know, why do we care about taxes? Who, who should care about taxes? I'm gonna take a step back and say, why do we have this taxing system, okay? The IRS has roughly 90,000 employees. It actually used to be much bigger. They've uh, cut a lot of jobs over the past couple of years, which has been in the news a lot. Um, you know, taxpayers spend, you know, some of them thousands of dollars every year preparing tax returns, a lot of grief, a lot of aggravation. So why, you know, why do we do this? Why do we have this huge IRS system? Why do we spend all this money preparing taxes? What's the point of all this? I'm not even a guess, guys. I'm sorry? 
why do we have this taxing system? Why, you know, why do we do this? Why do we go through this? Yeah, yeah, guys, we need money. You want to live in a civilized society with, you know, police departments and fire departments and schools and roads and bridges and, you know, an army, a uh, military to protect you. Um, this is why you. This is why we do this. The government can't operate without money. Um, so, and this is how this taxing system is how the federal government raises its money. Okay. Um, does anyone have any sort of guess of what revenue is federal? I'm not counting state here at all. For federal purposes, the government raised in 2014 how much in taxes they raised? Three trillion dollars. Okay. Three trillion dollars. And most of that comes from us, the individual taxpayers. For all the talk we hear about corporate taxes and corporations and their deductions and this and that, um, we contribute the vast majority of the money, right? It's, I think last year it was like 46.5% for individuals contributed. And that's our tax returns, the ones we're gonna be working on. 34% um, of it came through our payroll deductions, okay? You're gonna go to work, you're gonna get a lot of money taken out for FICA. Um, this is our Social Security and Medicare, okay? Um, that was 34% of the contributions. Corporations only contribute about 10% to the revenues, okay? And then the rest of it is made up by various taxes, things like excise taxes, uh, the estate taxes, uh, customs uh, duties, like when you're coming into the airport and they wanna know what you bought out of the country. Um, that makes up like another roughly 6% of the budget, okay, in those areas. Um, but most of the money comes from us. Can anyone guess where we spend most of the money? Sorry? Military is a big one. It's definitely one of the big three. Um, social, programs. Uh, social programs are on there. The number, go ahead. Healthcare. Healthcare is our number one, okay? Healthcare is our absolute number one. It actually used to be second, but it overtook um, retirement. Um, so as of 2014, we're spending more, uh, $921 billion. 26% of our spending goes to healthcare, most of it Medicare, okay? Uh, right behind that, very close behind that, is Social Security, which is our retirement, okay? Where, um, you, if you guys are working right now, you're getting money taken out of your paychecks. Um, and there's a big debate about whether or not we will ever see any of those Social Security dollars that we're contributing. Um, but as of right now, we're paying out $900 billion a year for Social Security for retirees. Um, the third biggest one was defense, okay? I think that's about $800 billion, which is almost 23% of our budget is our military and our defense. Um, welfare came in fourth. Um, that's things like uh, food stamps, that's things like uh, unemployment, it's uh, housing assistance, things of that nature. And I think that was roughly 10 to 11% of the budget. Um, and then, this is a number that always gets me, um, interest, okay? Interest on our national debt, $229 billion a year on interest. 6% of our spending just for interest. Uh, that number gets me. Most people don't bother, but that one always. Um, the other seven percent is made up things like you know the EPA, you know your Food and Drug Administrations, uh, research, schooling. Um, believe it or not, those things are less than seven percent. Okay? Most of the schooling falls on the states, um, but it's surprising how little they spend on infrastructure and these other things compared to these top numbers. Um, so anyway, guys, that's why we're here. That's why we have this tax system. That's why we spend so much money. That's why the IRS has so many employees. It's because we need to raise this money in order to do this level of spending. Um, so now, to follow the book, um, who cares about taxes? Um, and I would say the bigger question here is who doesn't care about taxes? Um, you guys have to be 18 years old to vote, to join the military. You have to be 21 to buy alcohol. Um, there is no age limit on who gets taxed. Okay? You have these tiny little child actors, and um, they're earning millions of dollars, they're paying taxes. They have to file a tax return, okay? So taxes affect everybody in every form of life. Um, it's not just, you know, filing an income tax return. You know, you're gonna go out and buy a new car today, and you're saying, I got $10,000 to spend. Well, you have literally have only $10,000 and not a penny more. You can't buy a $10,000 car, right? Because that $10,000 car is gonna cost you in New Jersey, 10700 okay? So it's affecting you every day when you go to the store and purchase. It's, there's an automatic, again, in New Jersey, 
7% markup that you have to remember, okay? Um, decisions like when you get maybe a little bit older, you know, do I, can I afford to buy a house or do I have to keep renting, you know? My rent payment's only $1,000. Uh, that house that I really want is gonna cost me $1,200. But if you guys know enough about the tax rules, and hopefully when we're done here, you will, um, you may know that, okay, well, of the $1,200, part of that is interest on my loan, and that's tax deductible. Um, that will drive down my taxable income. And if some of it goes towards property taxes, well, that's tax deductible too. So maybe your $1,200 payment is really only at the end of the day, by the time you take these deductions, Maybe it's really only costing you $800. Maybe buying is actually better than renting, even though on the surface you're looking at $1,000 versus a $1,200 payment. It may actually work out to be you know, $1,000 versus $800 if you understand you know, these deductions that may be available to you. It may sway your purchasing decisions. Um, something as simple as can I afford college, um, you know, which everyone goes through. Um, you may be looking, you know, if you have a loan, you may be able to deduct some of the interest on that. You may be able to deduct some of the costs of the schooling. You're getting a scholarship. Is it income? Is it not income? Um, depends on what, what it is and what the rules say. Um, hopefully, some of you guys will be going to work in a year or so. Um, maybe you have an employer offer you, you know, $50,000 a year plus medical. Great. Maybe the other employer offers you $45,000 a year plus medical. In the surface, you're saying, well, no brainer, $50,000 a year, right? Um, but maybe the second employer is offering you tuition reimbursement, and that you don't have to pay taxes on that, and that's income to you. Um, maybe they're offering you uh, 401k match, okay? That's more free money going right into your retirement. You're not going to use it today, but it's free money. So if you understand these, what's tax deductible versus what's not, again, it may make your choice very different. Initially, you want to save $50,000. Sure, I'm going to take that job. But when you start adding up these other fringe benefits, that may be available to you, and if you know whether or not they're tax deductible, you may make a different decision, okay? Um, as far as businesses go, I mean, their questions are gonna be a little bit different. They're gonna start with, you know, how do I structure a business? Maybe you're starting a business. Do I go into a corporate format? Do I form as an LLC? Do I form as a partnership, okay? The taxing behind these entities is very different. Um, you guys may know corporations, generally for tax purposes are the least desirable formation because they face what's known as double taxation, okay? Uh, corporations uh, are tax paying entities. Uh, they file a tax return, they pay taxes on their taxable income. And then they pay their shareholders in the form of dividends, right? They don't get to deduct those dividends, okay? They can deduct compensation that they pay their employees, but they don't deduct those dividends. So when you, the owners, receive those dividends, you're paying tax on that too. So they just pay tax on the taxable income. Now they're paying that taxable income out and you, the owner, is gonna pay tax on it again, okay? That's where entities are, uh, corporations, sorry, are subject to double taxation. The same isn't true for LLCs and partnerships. Now there's other attributes that may make a corporation um, more desirable um, and tax isn't gonna be the only decision, obviously. Um, but that's something to think about. Um, a corporation or a business may say, uh, which state should I locate in? Some states have corporate income taxes, some don't. Uh, some states offer incentives for certain types of businesses to come locate in their state, okay? Um, so again, if you're starting a business, you may say, you know what, it may make sense to do it in Texas. Um, or not, um, again, you have to know these rules. Um, I mean, that's the gist of it, guys, is, look, once you become aware of the rules and you understand them a little better, what you think was really a common sense decision up front or just a very easy, simple yes or no answer, if you understand some of these rules, again, your decision may be very different, okay? And hopefully, like I said, when we get to the end here, you'll have a better feel for some of these rules. Um, the book gets into politics. Um, I don't want to get into a political debate with anybody. <coughs> I'm sure everyone has their opinions and I'm sure everyone's opinions are very valid. Um, I don't generally care to discuss try, sorry. Um, politics, um, but overall, just so you guys have a feel, and you may be aware of this already, but Republicans, guys, they generally believe that taxes should only be raised for the essentials, the bare essentials. You know, military, you know, they don't believe in large taxation. They think that taxpayers 
should keep their money in their pocket, low tax rates. You keep your money in your pocket, and we, the taxpayers, decide what's going to drive this economy. I will buy into that type of company because I think that's where the future is going. Okay, so they feel that the taxpayer is going to really be the determining force of spending in the economy. Um, whereas Democrats typically stands more for they feel that the government should be the driving force behind the economy. Okay, we're going to raise taxes. And we're going to determine where jobs are going to go and which industries we're going to invest in, and we're going to put the jobs there by investing the money there. Okay, so that's really the kind of essentially difference when you boil boil it down at the end of the day. Um, the only thing I'll note is if you do eventually get into the industry or if you have any experience at all with it, um, it's interesting to watch because you can kind of tell who's in office. Um, and if you ever print out even just like a list of the tax rates over the past 50 years, you could tell Democrat in office, Republican in office, Democrat in office, Republican in office. And you can see the swings up and down and the changes in rates and the way things go. Um, so it's always interesting to see. Um, and as soon as there, there's an administration change, you can bet, you can bet taxes are one of the first things they're hit. Uh, and it's always, you know, we're coming up on another uh, election year next year. And you know, guys, taxes is going to be in the news, you know, front and center. Because um, it's always a hot button between the two parties. Um, okay, what is a tax? Okay, the book gives you three sort of hard and fast goals. It's a mandatory payment. Okay, it's not optional. It's mandatory. You have to pay it. Um, it. You have to pay it to a governing body. So we're focused on federal taxation, but it could be to a city, it could be to a state, uh, a municipality, uh, what have you. Okay, so it has to be to a governing body. And it cannot be an exchange for a specific benefit. Look, we all benefit from the military, but it's not like I have a, you know, the needy person standing out front of my house. Like he's not there to protect me. Okay, so you're paying into the system and you're reaping the benefits in general, but it's not something given just between you and the government. I don't write you this check in exchange for, you know, X, Y, and Z. Okay, so it's for a non-specific benefit. Okay, taxes are not intended to punish taxes. Your parents, I'm sure, will disagree with that. Um, but they're not intended to punish, okay? And they're not uh, intended to prevent you from engaging in illegal acts. Um, those are fines and penalties, okay? Fines and penalties are intended to punish you, and they're intended to stop you from engaging in illegal behaviors. Um, but look, guys, don't kid yourself. Taxes really do encourage and discourage certain behaviors, okay? Congress wants us to invest in certain things, and they want us not to do other things, okay? So they do use taxes to sway what you're going to do. They're not going to prevent you from doing it, but they're going to sway you. And how are they going to do that? I mean, as far as discouraging you guys, I mean, they're going to hit you with excise taxes, okay? Um, the book, I think, refers to them as sin taxes, but generally you're going to hear an excise tax. Like, you know, I drive a big gas guzzling car. Well, fine, you want to have that car. We're not going to stop you from having that car. But, you know, there's going to be an extra 10 cent premium on every gallon of gas you buy. And if you want to drive that big car, you better expect to pay up for it, okay? Cigarettes. Most packs of cigarettes, whether or not you know it, they have, a, a, you know, a, an excise tax on them, okay? An extra dollar or whatever, I don't know what the number is, per pack. Um, alcohol, a lot of states will put an excise tax on alcohol. Things that, you know, they don't really want you doing, but they're not going to stop you from doing it. If you're willing to pay it, you can have it, but you know, we prefer you not. And if they make it so cost prohibitive, maybe they can stop some people at least from doing it. Okay? That's an excise tax. And just the other note about an excise tax is it's not a percentage. Most of our taxes are a percentage, like you know, the cost of a pack of cigarettes. It's uh, a quantity. So it's number of packs of cigarettes, numbers of gallons of gasoline, I don't know, liters of alcohol. I don't know what the exact uh, measurement is for alcohol, but it's based on a quantity. Okay? Um, now, how do they earn, encourage you? And maybe you guys can figure out some of this. How, how would they encourage you to do something? I know you guys aren't taxpayers, probably most of you. Some of you might be. I mean, how would they encourage you to do something? So they'll give you a deduction, okay? Charitable contributions. They, you know, they want you to help charities out. It's a good thing. If it's a 501c3, a registered uh, charitable organization, they will grant you a deduction for donating that money. Um, 401ks, right? Retirement's good. We want people to retire. We don't want to have to support you when you're retiring. Um, so if you want to put money into an IRA or a 401k, great. We'll offer you a deduction for that. Okay? There's various deductions. If we get homeownership, we'll figure out there's a bunch of deductions for homeownership. Homeownership is good. 
government likes that, so they're going to offer you some deductions. Um, how else would they do it besides a deduction? Credits, okay? Tax credits. And we'll learn that credits and deductions are not the same thing, okay? Credits are typically a dollar for dollar reduction in your taxable income, whereas a deduction reduces your taxable income, but it's not a dollar for dollar elimination. Um, we'll get more into that later on. But they may offer you tax credits, okay? You go to the store and you're buying a new washing machine. Well, buy this energy certified one and we'll offer you a credit um, because it's good for the environment and that's good for the government. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of credits out there. But a credit is another way um, that you could do that. And the only uh, the other way I would say is exclusions, okay? They want to encourage certain behaviors. They may offer you uh, exclusions from income, saying even though you just received a check for $100,000, you don't have to count that in your gross income. Um, things like life insurance, okay? They're not gonna charge you for life insurance typically. You don't have to report that as gross income. Um, a big one is interest on municipal bonds. So they kind of subsidize the states, and they say that if you invest in a state bond and you earn interest on that bond, you don't have to pay taxes on it for federal purposes. For federal purposes, it doesn't necessarily apply for state purposes, okay? The federal government will not charge you for interest on a municipal bond because they're saying invest in the government, invest in your state, that's good, that's good for us. Um, so that's how they're encouraging you to do things, okay, is offering you um, exclusions, deductions, and credits, okay? Um, okay, even though taxes, guys, can't be exchanged for a specific benefit, right, we said it has to be a non-specific benefit, they can earmark a tax, it's called earmarking, a tax for a specific purpose. Um, so they could do something like, you know, the township of Newark or the city of Newark could say, you know, for every car parked in Newark uh, in a public garage, we're going to levy a $1 tax. Um, and we're going to take that $1 tax and we're going to use it to build a new theater in town. That's called earmarking. So, okay, you may be parking in a garage and paying that $1 tax, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to the theater. So it's in exchange for a non-specific benefit, but it's being used, designated for a very specific purpose. That's your marketing. They are allowed to do that. Um, the book brings up the Affordable Care Act, and I always find this interesting. Um, and it's a couple of years ago now, so the argument has kind of gone a bit stale, even though you still hear it from time to time. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the Affordable Care Act. The, what the rule basically says is that you have to have health coverage, okay? You and all the members of your family have to have health coverage, whether through an employee or you go buy it through the government. And if you don't buy this insurance, then you're subject to a penalty, or what they relabeled it actually is a tax. Um, so on your tax return starting uh, in 2014, they said that if you don't have coverage, you're subject to a $95. I think this year it's gone up to a three. 350, I forget what the number is. Um, and then next year it goes up to 695 or something like that. Um, and what happened here, guys, is that um, originally the way the bill was written is if you don't have this coverage, you're going to pay a penalty. Okay? Um, and this got uh, the state of Florida took the Department of Health and Human Services to court uh, under the Commerce Clause. And what the Commerce Clause is says is that um, Congress has the right to regulate trade among the states. And Florida came in and said, wait a minute, you're trying to regulate something that doesn't exist. We can understand you're trying to regulate you know, premiums on insurance and where you can buy your insurance from, and, but you're trying to force a penalty on something, a trade that doesn't exist. These people haven't bought anything. There's nothing there for you to regulate, right? There's no activity. Um, and the idea is, is that Congress has, the Commerce Clause is a very, very, very broad power. And the Supreme Court has always tried to keep it in check because um, they don't want Congress to get too out of control of it. They would just be giving them basically unlimited power. They'd be telling you, you have to wear red on Fridays, or you have to go to this school, or you have to do this. Um, so this is why Florida took them to court, saying you're trying to regulate trade that doesn't exist. You can't do that. Uh, and what happened is, is in order to get this bill put through and to see this thing stay alive, um, Justice Roberts basically rewrote the bill. Instead of calling it a penalty, they called it a tax, okay? 
um, that was really the only way they were going to get this thing to survive because they knew under the Commerce Clause they could never do this. Um, and there's a lot of articles out there about all the reasons why Obamacare is not technically a tax, why it's unconstitutional, etc. But you know, going back, I mean, and you guys may not be familiar with this aspect of it, when this bill got put through, uh, one of the things they said is that the only way they're really going to collect it is if you have a refund due, or you, you know, voluntarily send your check in for it. Um, but let's face it, okay, most of the people who need this type of coverage are going to be lower income taxpayers, right? Um, they may not even have to file a tax return, okay? If you don't have enough income, you don't have to file. Um, and the government has said, we're not going to go out and levy property, we're not going to go out and seek this, okay? The only way they're going to recoup it is as a refund. They'll take it off of your tax return if you do file. If you want to voluntarily send it in, thank you very much. But if you don't, and you don't file a tax return, we're not going after it, okay? So is it, then it becomes the question we just talked about, what is a tax? It's a mandatory payment to a government for a non-specific benefit. Well, is it really mandatory? If I don't file a tax return, no one's gonna bother me for it. Is it mandatory? From a taxing perspective, that's one of the, you know, kind of areas where it was very gray. Okay, very gray. And I only bring it up because the book brought it up. Um, so. Guys, you know what, I'm gonna leave off there because this is gonna get into different material. So I'm gonna leave off there, guys. Um,